Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're getting right on down near the close of this great book of Zechariah. Remembered of Yah. And Father does remember us, and He is returning. Have you noticed in the last few lectures how many times in that day, meaning in the Lord's day, that this has reference to? Friend, it's, it's talking about right now, what goes on now. And how it is just before that day, and even in uh, oftentimes during that day. We come to chapter 13 and verse 1, and we ask a word of wisdom from our Father, and we kind of start a new thought here, and it'll be kind of self explanatory. Verse 1 of chapter 13, Zechariah, and it reads uh, In that day there shall be a fountain opened. To the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. In other words, it's going to correct everything. Now, this isn't in the sense of baptism. You'll, you will read of this fountain in Ezekiel chapter 47 in the Millennium Temple, where from the throne of God runs a stream of water. And the further it goes, the deeper and the more, the stronger it gets. And until Ezekiel would say, I can't even cross this stream. And, and that's what it's for, is God's way of division, God's way of happening things. Now, this, this goes all the way back to the rock that brought forth, the fountain that brought forth water in the wilderness. Our Father takes care of His own. This, this is a water that is the living water. As a matter of fact, it's Christ, to be quite frank about it. This is not just simple future tense, but the verb, hey as it is utilized here, shall be, hey uh, with the particle, meaning that the fountain shall be permanently opened, not just partly open, not intermittent but permanently, meaning, what, what does that say to you? We're, we're in the eternity. We would even be in spiritual bodies at the time, of, like I said, it's the future tense, all right, meaning yet to happen. But it, it will take care of all unhappiness, all uncleanliness, all sin. There just won't be place for it, and, there, and, and nor would anyone even wish to with that living water flowing from the very throne of God, saturating the, the minds of the children. Um, what, a, what an interesting thing. All things evil cut off, done away with, destroyed. That's what we all work forward to. He kind of expects us to cut our own swath while we're on this earth. You know, we have to take care of business. He left us, he went to a far country and kind of left some of his servants in charge to kind of see to the vineyard. We haven't done real well. We've allowed a bunch of crooks to move in and become judges and a few other things. Not to say there's not some good. And uh, we just have to be real careful. We've got to take care of that vineyard. But this is going to be a time that there won't be room for any of that. It won't happen. That's why it's future tense, and that's why it's permanent. It's forever. Verse 2, And it shall, not maybe, it shall come to pass in that day. What day? The Lord's day. Saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets in the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Oh, my word, I wouldn't have thought he would have done that to the prophets, the fakes, the false prophets, those that say to you, well, God talked to me. We had a little talk today. You, you better mark that man. And I'm going to guarantee you something. If a man had a talk with God, he would not be revealing it. It would be orders to do something to take care of something. And he wouldn't be lightly, that's my point, he wouldn't lightly be discussing it. Why, it's a jarring time. And our Father does speak 
to certain people to make certain that the ends meets the, the needs of his prophecy, that his children ac accomplish what it is that they are to accomplish to bring this word to its fullness. Our, our father's in charge, and he's tired, very tired, of, of Satan working his little fake preachers into places, misguiding, misleading, making uh, our children a bunch of wet noodles. Yes, Christians just have to lay down and let everybody run over them. Yes, you just always turn the other cheek and let them slap you if they want to. You pop them in the face. Why? If you are teaching and you get a little carried away and you lay more on some preacher than his donkey can handle and he reach out and slap you, then turn the other cheek. But if some bully comes up to you on the street and pops you, pop him back. All right? There, th that's very Christian to do this. Christians are not, I repeat, not second-class citizens. No one is going to respect you if you are not due respect. And respect comes by settling for what's fair. Now, what would be fair, I'll, keep, I'll hang on to this analogy for a moment, what would be fair about you walking down the street and somebody coming up and popping you? It wouldn't be fair at all. So as a fair Christian, you got to do something about it. Point made, and that's the way it goes. God says, I'm finally going to take all that stuff away. But we do have that charge, my friend, and we are held accountable. Judgment begins at the pulpit. Judgment begins with preachers. That's why you had better, when you do research, you better research it in one or two languages. You had better research it and document it in the Masara, the heavier points, more specific points. You better know what you're doing because God corrects severely those at the pulpit that mislead. That's the first thing he warned about in Mark 13. He said, you know, don't, don't let people deceive you because there's many going to come saying, I, I'll be a Christian preacher. I'll be from Christ. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. He said, don't, don't believe them if they don't align with what Mark 13 has to say. And you know something? What you really need to do, if you want to check out your own preacher, and I'm not, I never mention churches or anything else, but you need to read Mark 13 where it says, there'll be many coming in my name. He says, the ones that come in my name will be teaching you this, that there will be wars and rumors of wars. But don't worry, not yet. When you hear a peace, 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 that's when you want to start being concerned that they will deliver you up before these fake preachers will have, ultimately cause you to be delivered up before the spurious Messiah, the synagogue of Satan. And you're not to premeditate what you say beforehand. Now that's the way you check your preacher out. If he's not teaching that, you got trouble, friend. Now, I hate to tell you that, and it might embarrass your preacher, but that's the teachings of Christ in Mark 13. He said, beware of those preachers that say they come in my name and don't teach you this. That, the Sermon on the Mount, it's all right there. It all leans toward and even is declared in Mark 13 that it has to do with the parable of the fig tree and the generation that's living in that time, and that's you. So you need to be very careful at this time. I mean... Father wrote you this letter so they could not deceive you. He said, I'm getting rid of those fakes, the false preachers, prophets, and the unclean spirits, those that say, well, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. You better be real careful what spirit spoke to you. They're going to be removed. Revelation 19, ultimately, they're going to be thrown in the fire, period. Verse 3, and it shall come to pass, not maybe, 
it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, you're not fit to live. For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth, fulfilling Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 6 through 11. That's what's supposed to happen to a false, a false prophet. Well, how can they be so sure that he's a fake? Well, if it doesn't align with God's word, he's a fake. Let, 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 me, let me give you documented proof of why you can trust God's word to that point. In the great, uh, we were mentioning Mark chapter 13, I'm going to use it again. It st states there uh, along in the, about the 20th, 23rd verse, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Through what? Through the prophets and the apostles, and there ain't no more. Anytime somebody comes up and prophesies something that isn't written in this word, or let me rephrase to say that goes against what is written in this word, you're listening to a fake. Period. Because God has already foretold us all things. It's been prophesied. I guess the question is, have you read it? Do you know what's in this letter that God has written to you whereby you can uh, uh, intelligently discern good from bad, good from evil? Verse 4. And it shall come to pass in that day. Again, there's not much tolerance here, friend. It either is or it isn't. Not maybe, not perhaps. It shall come to pass in that day that the prophet shall be ashamed every one of his vision. Now be careful what you're reading and absorb it for what is written, okay? Watch your object. When he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. They're not going to wear uh, what John the Baptist would down at the River Jordan. They're not going to, they're not going to let you. Now, how do we know that be ashamed of his vision. Well, let me ask you about that word, his. If, if a prophet gives a vision, it had better be a vision from God, a divine oracle, as you have read over and over in this great book of Zechariah. Not his, not the prophet's vision. Who cares about his dreams and visions? It's all right for him, but we don't care about him. If it's not from God, it's not fit to even talk about. Probably all he had was a sour pickle. It kind of bothered him, and he had a vision, all right? Probably um, a, a vision that there was a terrible buildup. Who knows what he visioned? But it's his vision, not God's. That's the point, and God wants you to know that. He said, I'm not going to put up with it. There, and he said, I'm, I'm not telling you it will come to pass that they will, the prophets will be ashamed of his vision. In other words, I'm going to make it come to pass. But that lets you know they're still out there spewing, spewing their garbage. Yes, I had a little talk with Jesus today. Oh, you did. Well, what did he have to say to you? It's his vision, not God's. God uh, has told, foretold us most things in this book. If he, has, if he ever, if you get off of a page and he's counting on you, don't worry. He'll speak to you then and, and at least put you back on the right page, but it will still be what's written in this book, this holy word. God's vision, not ours, not mine and not yours but a divine oracle from Almighty God. He expects us to rather teach what his prophets prophesied rather than some fruitcake out saying he's a prophet. Liars run to and fro, but God is going to cleanse the earth. Praise God. Verse 5. 
but he shall say, I am no prophet. I am a husbandman. I'm, a, I'm just a farm boy. For man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. All I was ever taught, I'm no prophet, was how to be a good farm boy and take care of, be a good cowboy out here taking care of cattle. That's it. Not me, boy. You know, after they're caught in their stuff uh, by a true scholar of God's word, they sure like to backpedal like an old Oklahoma crawdad. They can sure move backwards. It's already too late. God's got their number. Verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Now listen carefully. Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. It was in the house of my friends that this happened. Do you know where those wounds are in his hands? Where he was nailed to the cross. Remember I told you only a lecture or so back that you find uh, those wounds that there will still be very obvious when he returns and you'll read of it in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. His friends didn't treat him real well, but even within that there is a purpose and a reason and, and Jesus himself would, um, Jesus himself would say this, he would. And um, I think it, it uh, bears repeating, if I can get my memory to get going for me here. In um, okay. Well, we're going to come to it in just a minute. I'm going to let that go just a little bit longer. But Christ himself would, uh, would repeat this. Okay, where are these wounds? How did they come from? How could we know? Well, we do know, don't we? That he received them among his own disciples because one betrayed him. And how terrible it was when that one betrayed him that uh, he would be treated in, in this way, okay? And I still think I want to go there. You're not going to have it, okay? We're going to Mark chapter 14. And I'm going to pick it up with verse 27. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night for... For it is written, oh, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. And after that, I am, after that I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. And this is that time. It's written in the seventh verse here that we're about to come to in this great book. But I wanted you to know that Jesus spoke the words long before that uh, they'll smite the shepherd and the sheep shall scatter. But did you notice what he told them in verse 28 of Mark 14? But after that I am risen. After I come out of that tomb, I will go before you into Galilee. You don't look for me here. I'm going to meet you back in Galilee. And they were real surprised when he turned up there. Really surprised. They wouldn't even go to the door. Now returning to where it is written that that very thing would happen, back to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Listen carefully. After the remarks about the wounds in his hand by his friends, Awake, O sword! What sword? The sword of the Lord. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow saith the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Um, actually, it comes to the purification of God's own <clears throat> that men 
I mean, Christ himself paying that awesome price, even at the hands of his own friends. And they are scattered. But that's what this chapter is about, is the gathering back together, getting rid of the fakes, false teachers, false prophets, and those that would abuse our children. We get rid of them. The restoration is taking place. Verse 8 of the same chapter, chapter 13. And it shall come to pass, not if, not and, absolutely, shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, uh, one third. You know, it is amazing how many people are not even familiar with God's Word. It is amazing how many people are just absolutely biblically illiterate. He tells you right here, two-thirds of them are not even going to know which way the wind's blowing or what's going on. Well, when? On that day, just before that day, the Lord's day. Well, it's hard for me to understand that. Well, it shouldn't be. Listen to their conversations. Listen to them in the tournaments. Listen to them in this place or that place. Even listen to some of their preachers. It's obvious they have not, no idea, not the least little thought of what's actually transpiring. Even at this time, as we have our men, our troops, our frontline troops, both men and women, that are walking the streets of old Babylon that actually had a ceremony there four or five days ago in this time whereby we turned the authority of that old city, Babylon, and the surrounding area over to a Polish general and a group of international troops. Interesting, what? Why would the, the um, change of command and the celebration thereof took place in the old city of Babylon that the type of Satan himself, the type of king of Babylon himself, uh, Saddam Hussein, spent millions replacing the brick in that city until it would make quite a tourist attraction to this day. The Iraqi people ever get it situated. But don't you understand what's happening here today? Same country, you have Ur, the place of Abraham's beginnings. Our troops are there. There are many things transpiring that should catch our attention that our Father is in control. You know, within the sight of many of these places, at the birth of our beliefs, beginning with Abraham is what I'm talking about, that as of recent years, with the so-called dictator, king of Babylon, so to speak, Saddam Hussein, that buses and trucks would pull up in the desert and trenches would be dug and innocent people run out of the buses and gunned down like animals and buried and then closing off and driving away within the sight of these things. And people say, duh, wonder what that meant. Wonder how come that to be. I don't even have time to think about it. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Well, there's a lot of things transpiring right now that people had better be thinking about. You'd better be thinking of the prophecy of this word because it is not the prophecy of a man, but the prophecy of your father as it was given to the prophets, the men. And do you know something? It's real because it's, trans it's transpiring before our very eyes this day concerning this generation of the fig tree 
in which all these things will be complete and finished. What a time to live. And you're living in that time. I don't know, did you scatter or are you ready to be gathered back? Does the truth draw you? Does it change your life? Does God's blessings, once you begin to adhere to his word, does it uh, make you consider and understand? And don't forget that in Mark chapter 14, verses 27, 26 and 27, that, that he said, it's going to happen. How weak people can be. You know, I, what, what would have happened, and this probably is not a fair question, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, an analogy, I should say. This is not a fair analogy. But what if Christ had never been crucified and the sheep had never scattered, that they were all taken care of and fed nicely there, and, and uh, everything would have just been hunky-dory? Oh, do you really believe that people, if they have it that nice, Somebody had to pay the price. And somebody had to test the children to see if they had faith or not. They had to be scattered. Because it means a great deal to our father if one of those families that is scattered several generations down the line and a child then comes along and says, I believe the word of God. He is my father. And he knows he can use that child. For that child has the faith to believe the word of God as it is written, so it shall come to pass. And that's why God so loves the children of this generation that though many years have gone and you've had many soothsayers that will say, oh, it ain't going to happen. Everything goes on the same. Well, it doesn't. And this generation documents it. There's nothing new under the sun. But yet at the same time, mark the days, nothing will remain the same in the rest of this generation. It will change from time to time as we consummate the end of this age. You're there, friend. It's coming. The sheep have scattered, but God loves his sheep, and he's going to gather them back into one fold. Verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, oh, we got that, two parts, uh, they're going to be cut off and they're going to die. Right. They're, uh, a, die a spiritual death because they have no conception. And most of them say, we're going to fly like a big butterfly. Well, it's not biblical. As a matter of fact, God would say in Ezekiel 13, verse 22, through 23, I'm against that. I don't like it to those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. I've got work for them to do. Be thankful that you may be the third that is left therein, nine, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name. Whose name? Not the false one. Not some fake prophet. Not that idle shepherd, but the true shepherd. And I will hear them. I will say, it is my people and me. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Yahweh Shema, God is there. What a time to live, beloved. Refine, do you know how you refine silver? When you put the fire to it in the old furnace, the slag goes to the outside and falls off, and the nearer the center, the more perfect the silver, the real thing. And that fire that refines his children is none other than our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, the consuming fire. That fire, if you are evil, will toast you. It will smoke you, my friend. But if you're one of God's children, it is the Holy Spirit, that consuming fire that warms your very soul and touches you when God speaks to you through the Word, through the Holy Spirit. 
leads you, guides you, directs you, heals you. It's your Father. And He loves to bring about that process of purification. You know, if the people are thus, as silver ore is thus, if you had silver ore and you never put the fire to it, all you would ever have is silver ore. And, you know, but once the fire is put to it and it is refined, it is beautiful. It is beautiful. It separates the real thing from slag. Ooh, old slag that just runs off. And that's how God, you know, we need a little purifying every once in a while, and God does get rid of the slag from you. And make, it makes you see the real thing. Yes, my friend, we started this chapter by saying a fountain would be opened in that house forever, never to be shut or closed again. And it would cleanse everything that came near it because it is the living water for which Christ is the Savior. You can read of that stream again, as I stated, in Ezekiel chapter 47. It's a beautiful thing. And you're there. You're in that time that God intends to pull together the chief shepherd. Did he not promise? Did he not promise? If I have a hundred sheep, a hundred means election or God's elect. If even just one of them, one of them goes astray, I'm going to leave the 99 and go after that one because I care. They are my sheep and no man can take them from my hand. It's time for that gathering of the lambs, of the sheep. God's word is complete within itself. His love abounds as he purifies, as he matures, as he brings you into shape that he can use you in these end times. You know, he described us as a weapon not too many lectures ago. He said, Judah, the house of Judah is my bow, and the house of Israel are my arrows. He's going to use you if you're, if, if you're fit. And that's why he puts the final touches to the beautiful real thing whereby you're able to serve him and he can say, yes, that is my child. I'm so very happy with them. I can use them. I can depend on them. I can count on them. They won't be deceived. So, it's up to you. God sent you this letter to, preve to prevent you from being deceived. Have you read it? It's fantastic. Don't miss the next lecture, the conclusion. I could teach the whole Bible from Zechariah, but I could teach all of Revelation and much of the Bible in the final 14th chapter. We'll complete it in the next lecture. Don't miss it. All right. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. Won't you please?